Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session today. My name is Sharon Donovan, and it's my pleasure to be co-chairing this session with my colleague, Emmerd Meyer, who's a physician and researcher at UCLA. I will be providing the introduction, and Emmerd will be providing the concluding statements, and together we'll be moderating the Q&A following this session. The title of our session today is Balancing Planetary and Human Health, the Crucial Role of Biodiversity. The session is sponsored by the Yogurt and Nutrition Initiative. So let me just take a minute to introduce you to the initiative. So this is our ninth Yini Summit. So Yini, or the Yogurt and Nutrition Initiatives for Sustainable and Balanced Diets, is a collaborative project between Danone Institutes International and the American Society for Nutrition. And it was established in 2013. Our mission is to advance scientific knowledge on sustainable and healthy diets and the place of yogurt in them, and then to broadly share this information in three languages, currently English, Spanish, and French. We have an um, eminent board of scientific experts in, that are international and cross-disciplinary. We have a very strong digital ecosystem. We host scientific events such as the one today. We publish the outcomes of these events in peer-reviewed journals, and we also host a small grants program to promote research in this area. We have a very active international online community of over 60,000 members with a total reach of more than 250 million people. So I really encourage you to visit our website and also our um, Twitter and Instagram pages for the latest in information from the Yogurt and Nutrition Initiative. So our session today will be, um, we'll have three presentations. The first by um, Fabrice de Klerk, who will be talking about One Earth, increasing evidence of the interconnection between the planet, people, and health. Next, Joelle Dore will be taking us to human connections and talking about the gut microbiome diversity, the link between food, gut health, gut microbiota and health. And then finally, Herbert Hert will talk about soil microbiome diversity, the link between soil, microbiome, plant, food, and health. So as you can see, we're very interested in looking at the whole biome from earth to individual. And we think we have a very exciting um, session for you today. So following our scientific program, we will have a live Q&A session please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You'll also have the opportunity to upvote on existing questions to increase their priority. So with um, no further delays, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Fabrice de Klerk. Thanks for that introduction, Sharon. It's a real treat to be with you all today. My name is Fabrice de Klerk. I'm science director at Eat and a scientist with CGIR. And what I'd like to focus on today is, is your connection between people, planet, and health. And I think really try to emphasize the biology of the solutions that we're looking at and present some links between soil microbiome and human gut microbiome. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, uh, I'm uh, an ecologist. Uh, and so the way that I look at the world is really through uh, ecology. In ecology, eco or oikos is the study uh, of the house. Uh, and there's two houses that I want to focus on. First, I think, is uh, this really special place that we inhabit, and that is the planet Earth. And this is a fantastic photo taken by the Cassini space probe as it was shooting past, past Saturn, but looking back. And in the lower right-hand side, you see this tiny blue dot with a, an arrow pointing to it. That's our home. That, that's planet Earth. And as far as we know, it's the only place anywhere where there is life. And so biodiversity or the collection of diversity of life is really a unique feature of where we live. But unfortunately, I think a feature that's too often under understood and underappreciated as we look towards a human and environmental health. For those of us working on, on Earth systems or environmental systems, 
I think we've really begun to realize the degree to which we've now entered a new geological era, uh, the Anthropocene, you know, a topic or a title that now has begun to be used uh, by uh, both scientists, as depicted here in nature, but also uh, in the public dialogue as seen here in The Economist. And the Anthropocene very simply recognizes that, that humanity has become the biggest force uh, on the planet, uh, that rivaling that of other geological forces, and that we merit I think, recognizing that this geological era that we've entered is one that is defined by, by humanity. Second, I think, really critical feature about the Anthropocene is recognizing the decisions that we make this decade have planetary scale impacts, geological scale impacts. And so it's really time, I think, I think quite critically about which trajectory we choose how is it that we want to define our relationship with the Earth, our home, and with the biodiversity that inhabits it? One of the key challenges uh, with one of my institutions, EAT, that we decide to really begin to tackle is trying to understand what is this relationship between the foods that we eat, our own human health, but also planetary health. Food, as you understand, it really is our closest relationship with our own health but also is our most closest relationship with planetary health. What foods we eat, how we eat them, how we produce them, how much we lose in waste, but where we produce them, all have tremendous impact on both dimensions of health, human and planetary. So a result of that work was one, trying to see whether we could define what is a healthy diet. And to do that, we focused on two elements. One is quality. So recognizing that everyone everywhere should have access to approximately or at least 2,500 kilocalories per day. Yes, that will vary a little bit based on age, gender, activity level. But globally, it is a planetary challenge to make sure that we can provide this amount of food for everyone everywhere. And second, this quality depicted by the image on the plate here. Uh, so about half of our plates covered with fruits and vegetables recognizing the importance of many of our staple crops, rice, maize, wheat, but why not teff, donia, sorghum, millet, and other whole grains as key sources of energy, recognizing the value of animal source foods, but for many of us consuming those in much more moderate amounts, for many of us increasing consumption of plant-based proteins, uh, and a limited amounts of unsaturated plant oils and added sugars. But I think what you really recognize here is the diversity of foods, the balance of those foods, proportion of those foods that, that allow us to lead healthy lives. Right now, too many of us uh, are not able to access either enough food, 2 billion uh, people, but there's a growing number of individuals, 2 billion as well, who are struggling to find, again, that diversity and that balance. So you put those two numbers together and approximately half of the global population today is struggling with accessing a, a healthy diet. This is a major a global challenge. When we look at the health impacts of that challenge, we realize that there are 11 million premature adult deaths per year related to diet-related disease. So simply transitioning towards healthy diets would allow us really to improve the quality of life uh, for uh, many people across the globe. The second dimension of the work that we try to do with this the Atlantic Commission is to define, well, what are the environmental limits of food? And what is then the relationship between how we produce food, how we consume food, and planetary health? We borrowed a, a concept led by Johan Rockström and other scientists, the planetary boundaries concept, which basically looks at what is the resting rate of the planet over the policy of this geological era that we're now emerging out of. And can we then understand what are the environmental limits of this very stable geological period that, that we've come out of? And can we understand then what is human pressure or what is human impact on pushing past these boundaries and begin to understand what are the actions that we can take that bring us within what we would argue is a safe environmental space. Within these nine boundaries, food has a huge impact. Food creates one-third of greenhouse gas emissions, one of the planetary boundaries that we see here. Food production is a major disruptor of both the nitrogen and the phosphorus cycle. Food production accounts for 80% of freshwater use globally. Food production accounts for 40% of land globally. That's nearly half of all lands globally 
that have been appropriated by humanity for either cities and shelter or for food production. And food production consumption is a biggest driver of biodiversity loss flow, primarily through habitat conversion or food production. These are major environmental limits, which are impacted by, again, by how we produce and consume food and within which we're trying to understand how can we bring ourselves back within these environmental limits. I want to focus on biodiversity for the rest of this presentation. And, and what I want to emphasize with this figure created by Shahid Naeem at Columbia University is that when we think about biodiversity, we tend to think about panda bears and orangutans, bison, all these charismatic megafauna, as the biodiversity community likes to call them. And quite often, our conservation objectives are about leaving enough space, these wild spaces, for this wild biodiversity. And this is a really important goal. But what I think it often misses is that when we change uh, species composition, species abundances, these proportions within the ecosystems, and that's what's represented by the three images across the top, changing tropical forest to agriculture, changing savannas uh, and to agriculture, changing marine ecosystems to food production systems, we're changing the proportions, the diversity, the densities of species within those systems. And it's not just a change in those species numbers, if you will, or biodiversity, but ultimately we're impacting how those, how those systems function, how carbon is cycled, how much carbon is stored and stocked in those ecosystems versus transferred to the atmosphere. We impact the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the oxygen production. So biodiversity really is much more than a collection of species. But it is equivalent to, if you want, the global operating system. And when we change species composition, we change key functions that these biomes are able to provide. The classic example, which I think many of you are familiar with, is tropical deforestation, which is a major source, not just of biodiversity loss, but a major source of greenhouse gases and climate change. We move carbon stored in plants transfer to the atmosphere as we convert these landscapes to from tree-based systems to annual crop-based systems. So it's not only the loss of the system, but the loss of the function that, that really interests us. What I think is really exciting about today's presentation is that we're going to focus on two ecosystems that really don't get enough attention. One is our own gut, human microbiome, and the second one is a soil microbiome. These are two ecosystems which, just like macrobiomes, provide function regulated by biodiversity. We have the same kinds of functions and processes occurring within the gut microbiome and soil microbiome. But we really have not paid enough attention to either of these two. So what I'd like to do as I continue on is to think like an ecologist and ask, what are the systemic changes that we might be thinking about or the questions that we might ask as we begin to think about these two ecosystems from a much more functional biodiversity point of view. The first is that we're finding that, that there's tremendous homogenization of food globally. The figure on the left shows 1961, 1985, 2009, the diversity of foods that were on our plates. And you see if these circles are getting smaller and smaller. So globally, we're finding that we're consuming a smaller number of species and there's a much greater homogenization of foods that are on our plates. The second figure on the right is the number of varieties within major food groups. So even within a single species, the diversity of foods, the diversity of varieties that have on our plates is reducing tremendously, several orders of magnitude in several cases. So when we begin to think about diversity, not just the wild places, not just the functions, but particularly I think the diversity that we put on our plates and related to that, the diversity that are in our, our fields. When we look at the primary drivers of premature mortality globally, you know, that 11 million that I was flagging earlier on, this is what we see emerging as the top 10 of variables that drive that premature mortality. This is fantastic work by the Global Burden of Disease Collaborative, looking at mortality rate attributable to diets and the number of global, uh, a number of deaths at the global level which will diet. And what I want you to see is that we talk a lot about meat and protein as a health challenge, but when you look at the top variables, high in sodium is number one, but then just below that, low in whole grains, low in fruits, low in nuts and seeds, low in vegetables, low in seafood, low in fiber. 
Then we have low inlaid use. So the top seven variables are all about underconsumption of protective foods, plant-rich diets. So low dietary diversity has become a major source of premature mortality globally. This is clearly related to protein consumption, right? If you're trying to stay within a 2,500 calorie diet and you're eating a lot of animal source protein, then the number of calories available for plant diversity becomes much lower. So I think this is really the two sides of the same coin, learning how we balance these different foods on our plate and getting the proportions right. But I think we don't speak enough about increasing the diversity of foods in diet and particularly the diversity of plant-rich foods in diet. One of the very early studies that began to look at the relationship between human health and dietary health was led by David Tillman and Michael Clark, who began to ask the, began to ask the question, well, if we were able to transition towards a healthy diet, what impact would this have on, on the environment? This was a fantastic study back in 2014. They used the Mediterranean diet, the pescatarian diet, and vegetarian diets as examples of uh, diets that would uh, shift the proportion of meat versus plant-based. I, I don't mean to, to state that they were saying that these are the three diets that we should all follow. This was just their way of categorizing a gradient of uh, food consumption. And what they found is that if we follow business as usual, looking at these environmental variables, we're going to increase just through consumption greenhouse gas emissions by 20 to 30 percent. Uh, and uh, that we would also increase the amount of land that we need by 800 million hectares. Many biodiversity colleagues of mine argue we don't have this land available. What they also found is that if you shift towards Mediterranean, pescatarian, or vegetarian, that you can actually begin to reduce your emissions and maybe even become negative in food-based emissions, as well as uh, imagine a food consumption that would require zero land conversion. I think that the big result from this study, again, was just to emphasize that not only how we produce food or what food we produce, but food consumption is a major means of achieving our major environmental goals. Looking at those same diets, that what they found is that those same transitions have really important effects on several causes of a disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, coronary mortality, and all causes of mortality. And we're beginning to suspect that the relationship here is one about protective food consumption and its relationship to microbiome, which we're going to cover later on today. What I then want to emphasize is that when we look at these planetary boundaries, one of the ones that concerns ecologists like me is the rate at which we're losing species globally. We now recognize that we're entering the sixth extinction. There have been five previous extinctions in global uh, history, in the history of the Earth. The five previous ones have all been led by catastrophic geological events, eruptions, near strikes, uh, etc. This sixth one is led by, by us, by humanity. And this is really, again, emblematic of this notion of anthropocene, where, where humanity is what's driving these changes. And I love the quote by Al Gore here, reviewing Elizabeth Colbert's, Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Extinction. We are deciding without quite meaning to which evolutionary pathways will remain open and which will forever be closed. No other creature has ever managed this, and it will unfortunately be our most enduring legacy. When Al Gore wrote this, he was very much thinking about macrobiomes. But when I think about what we're beginning to understand about microbiomes, I think we're realizing that these have been two forgotten ecosystems. Ecosystems where in many places and with many societies, with many individuals, we may already have undergone some rather significant extinctions and some rather important consequences to both human health as well as to planetary health, which again, the next two speakers will, begun, will begin to speak to. If I look at microbiomes from a macrobiodiversity lens, there's some really important or fascinating questions that begin to emerge. The first is, where do these biomes come from? In ecology, we talk about island biogeography. Islands create these really unique places where we can study how our habitats colonized. Krakatau, which exploded in 1883, is one of the classic examples of the creation of a virgin ecosystem, a massive volcanic eruption, which denudes the island completely, 
and ecologists then become excited about it, say, well, what happens next? Which are the first species to arrive? How quickly do species arrive? How does the arrival of biodiversity on this island affect the creation of soil, the creation of a soil microbiome? And we have this fantastic theory that suggests that depending on how far an island is from a continent and how large that island is, that we can predict quite closely the number of species that will eventually be able to inhabit the island, as well as how quickly that they can begin to colonize it. We think about this from the point of view of, of what we call relay floristics, right? And some theoretical questions that ecologists like to ask is, is this about which species comes first? And does that first species create the conditions for other species to then come along later? Or is it initial floristics where there's a huge set of species that are available from the start, but again, that the first species to become active create the conditions that allow the other species to, to arrive. So this notion of how do we succeed or what's the succession from a virgin ecosystem to a, a lush tropical or temperate forest. When we think about the, ourselves, we then realize that we're actually islands unto ourselves. We're all born in the same way that Krakatoa was born, a, a virgin ecosystem that is devoid of, of any microbiome. I think a really interesting statistic on the microbiomes is that we realize that we share 99% of our human genome with the rest of humanity. But when we look at our individual microbiome, we share less than 0.1% of that. And that our human genome is 20,000 genes, but our microbiome is 2 million genes. And so we really are much more unique, if you will, from a microbiome point of view than we are from a human genome point of view. It raises some interesting questions about, well, how do we ensure that we allow each of us to begin to develop the, that microbiome? What are the consequences of choices that we make as society? Starting with, uh, start, starting with a, uh, either cesarean birth or vaginal birth. This is that first shot of biodiversity that we are exposed to as we pass uh, through the birth canal and, and are born. What happens if we're breastfeeding or not breastfeeding in terms, again, increasing exposure to microbiome? The foods that we eat, pets or no pets in the house, the uh, exposure uh, to, to soil when we're children or to nature when we're children or the relationships that we develop as adults. These are all the same kinds of events that allow biodiversity to colonize islands and create, again, that succession of processes that, that determine the flora on an island or uh, the flora in our own uh, uh, microbiome. The second, I think, important question that is raised is, well, how do we then take care of a microbiome, whether it's a soil microbiome or a gut microbiome, as we develop? And here, again, there's some interesting ecological analogies that I'd like to draw and have us think about as we go through today's presentations. The first is we till soil on an annual basis. We're constantly disturbing, taking that topsoil, flipping it over, exposing it to air. So there's a lot of oxidation of the uh, soil carbon that happens through that process. And it changes the soil microbiome from a, a fungi-dominant one to a bacterial-dominant one with changes in the capacity of that soil to store carbon or to produce food. We also provide a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus to those soils. And this might be the equivalent of a high sugar diet, right? We provide a readily available nutrient, which is normally rare, which speeds up or ramps up biological processes, allows rapid growth, but also rapid oxidation. So can we think differently about how we apply nutrients to our soils so that they become a slower burn, more resilient to change? We apply a lot of agrochemicals to our, our soils. Uh, we use herbicides just to facilitate the harvest of soy, for example, in the US. Is this equivalent to the use of antibiotics? And are the impacts of taking or overtaking uh, antibiotics equivalent to the use of biocides within agriculture? Does this mean that we're constantly resetting soil microbiomes and human microbiomes through the use of antibiotics or, or through pesticides? And finally, dietary diversity. Uh, the image here is a young man in England who uh, lived, I think, his first 18 years just on chicken nuggets. Uh, and we realized that a low diversity diet has huge impacts on our microbiome. It determines the composition of that microbiome and in turn, the functional capacity of that microbiome. We do the same thing in agriculture. We grow the same crop year after year, 
on massive extensions of land. So what do we expect of a soil microbiome that is fed corn roots year in, year out? It's going to be a very different soil microbiome with a very different functional capacity than if we begin to rotate different crops on that same soil or grow multiple crops together. So all of these, I think, are just questions to think about if we're going to, if we realize that by the base extinctions that we've been faced with are microbiome extinctions, does that change the perspective of how we might want to both treat ourselves and our own microbiome, but also how we might want to treat agricultural soil uh, microbiomes? And does it offer a different set of solutions that we might look at? As we look to 2030, there is a big campaign led by many conservation organizations. We will be signing the Convention on Biological Diversity this fall. And the big challenge that we're trying to set for ourselves is can we set a global goal for nature to be nature positive by 2030? And I think the fundamental recognition of this goal is that we're in a deep slide in terms of biodiversity globally, not just charismatic species, but also function and contribution to ecosystem function. Can we bend the curve on biodiversity loss and really begin to set ourselves on a path for recovery? recognizing again that this is a biological planet and that it may be a wiser investment to learn how to work with biodiversity rather than in opposition to it. And I think for the health community, the challenge is to ask ourselves, can we transition from an antibiotic approach to a probiotic approach? And I know these terms can be very specific. And what I mean by probiotic is can we become better at working with biodiversity in nutrition and health than working without it? I want to leave you with four main uh, thoughts as we think about what the future might be of a probiotic uh, society or a probiotic health plan. One is learn to manage the system, not the species. Right? I think Krakatoa reminds us that there are events in our lives, birth, our relationship with our mother, our relationship with others, our environment, which determine what microbiome that we have. These are systemic choices that we need to be thinking about. Second, input diversity equals output diversity. The diversity of fresh foods in our diets seems to be very pro-protective in terms of health impact. And so the diversity of fruits, nuts, vegetables, and even the meat products is a key means by which we cultivate a healthy gut microbiome. And I hope that we can apply these same lessons to agriculture. Third, Focus on function. Let's better understand what are the functional groups in the microbiomes and how we can support their capacity to provide those functions. And the last one is beware of invasive species. When we look at biodiversity loss globally, invasive species are the number two driver of extinctions globally. And I wonder, as we think about gut microbiomes in particular, but even probiotics uh, in agriculture, if we just need to take a little bit of time to ask ourselves a single species approach or where we're introducing novel species or organisms into either our own microbiomes or our cultural microbiomes, let's be sure and think through what the consequences are of a homogenization, biological homogenization of either guts or soil microbiomes going forward. I think there's a really exciting avenue. I think that microbiome research, both in agriculture and in human health, is going to reveal some fascinating new ideas, new approaches, and it will be a key component to setting us forward on a road to sustainability, both for people and for planet. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to the question and answer period. Sharon, over to you. Well, thank you, Fabrice. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Joelle Duray, who is a research director at the INRA Michaelis Institute for Food and Gut Microbiology and scientific director of the Metagenopolis. He is a world expert in gut microbiome, and we're very happy to welcome him here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'll start expressing my gratitude for this opportunity to give a, what will be a zoom into the gut microbiome and its uh, interconnection with food and health. I'm Joël Doré. I'm research director with INRAE in France and uh, uh, scientific director of Metagenopolis uh, unit. 
I'll start with a disclaimer, highlighting some links of interest with a, a number of uh, industrial companies with whom we've been uh, working on and research co-founded by some of those. Uh, I also was involved in editorial work on the uh, intestinal microbiota, a full-fledged organ, together with my colleague Philippe Marteau. And um, I'm scientific advisory board member for a few companies and co-founder of some of those, including Matt Pharma. Um, we humans are um, symbiosis. We are microbial, we are ecosystems. And this symbiotic relationship starts from the very moment of birth where we meet the microbial world, and we will at the same time mature our immunity and develop our microbiota, which lead to this uh, unique situation where the microbiota itself is recognized as a component of self, like any cell, any tissue, any organ of the human body. And this is key if we want to uh, innovate in terms of prevention and therapeutics of the symbiotic human. It will have impact on evaluation, monitoring, prevention, and treatment. Now, we are microbial to the point where each of us in adulthood interacts on a constant basis with 50 trillion bacteria and many more microbes. This is uh, 50 trillion, as many as we have human cells in our body. And as microbiome science allows us to count genes today, we know that we, uh, on average, uh, carry 600,000 microbial genes in our dominant microbiome, which is 25 times the size of the human genome, highlighting the potential massive functional contribution of our microbes. Uh, now, I will split my presentation in three parts. Uh, first, giving metagenomic highlights, um, what we have got to learn recently on uh, the human metagenome. Then zooming into symbiosis and going into details of uh, what symbiosis between man and microbes can be, and then highlighting the interconnection between food, gut microbiota, and health. In just one slide, what we have uh, shown, analyzing the metagenome, i.e. the combined genomes of all dominant microbes of the uh, uh, human associated microbiome, so to speak, and I'm zooming here on the gut, uh, we essentially have a highlight of the pathway we use. We extract total DNA from uh, these ecosystems and apply whole genome shotgun sequencing. And we can assemble, annotate genes, and build the reference gene catalog. Today, a resource of more than 10 million bacterial or microbial genes that we use for direct mapping of short sequences to uh, determine the metagenome profile. And from that, we have learned that we share a small set of common bacterial species and genomes, which we can view as a core metagenome. And yet, we harbor a large, unique set of microbes evolving rather slowly over time for a given human individual. Um, we differ by our gut ecology. We described uh, nearly 10 years ago now uh, the uh, anterior types as stratifiers of the human population, and we differ by gene count or uh, a, representation, a representation of diversity. Uh, and I will show how this can be viewed as a health stratifier. And finally, we've been able to describe uh, differences uh, in microbiome composition um, that can be viewed as diagnostic signatures, possibly predictive signatures in various disease conditions such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, and uh, liver cirrhosis. Now, how, um, uh, how, how, how much of a symbiosis are we and why do we look into this? One of the key reasons is that... Um, we have seen uh, through the second half of the previous century that as we were owing to progress in medicine, owing to uh, hygiene, vaccination, uh, antibiotics, as we were controlling ever better uh, infectious conditions, then we did see the uh, uh, onset of a uh, chronic disease epidemics. Uh, the curves were all on the rise to the right. They indicate uh, that following recent transitions, uh, we've seen uh, this increase in incidence uncontrolled for now more than 60 years of uh, a number of chronic conditions, immune-related, sometimes autoimmune conditions, associated with uh, changes in birth mode and environment, 
changes in nutrition and life habits, changes in exposure to uh, xenobiotic compounds that uh, Fabrice de Klerk already uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, the, one of the extreme uh, cases is uh, autism, for which the, the rise in incidence is exponential. 25% of, or so of this is due to uh, an improvement in diagnosis, meaning that indeed it's exponentially rising. It's one birth out of 50 in the U.S. today, one out of 150 or so in the U.K. or France. Um, and the World Health Organization is anticipating that one person, one human in four, will be concerned by one or the other of those uh, chronic conditions by 2025. So we have a situation where global health and life expectancy may be a threat, and we urgently need to rethink prevention and medicine. Now, the common thread in chronic conditions has been as a start, the evidence of altered microbiota. And this is true for hepatogastroenterologic uh, conditions, obviously, but also true for metabolic conditions, such as insulin resistance or obesity, for strictly immunity-related uh, aspects, such as allergies or autoimmune diseases. But it's also true for diseases that relate to uh, the central nervous system, autism spectrum disorder, major depressive disorders, multiple sclerosis. And yet after we uh, documented alteration of the microbiota, we were led to realize that, in fact, what we deal with is a disruption of host microbes symbiosis. So altogether, we have altered microbiota, but also a leaky gut syndrome, an inflammatory state, mostly low grade, and oxidative stress coming with inflammation in conditions where we have no current prevention, no cure. Uh, now, an illustration of that is given here. We have this uh, correlation between uh, low richness of the microbiota, uh, leaky gut syndrome, combining their effects to lead to inflammation, itself leading to oxidative stress, and then we close the circle, oxidative stress, uh, aggravating the alteration of the microbiome. We have circular causalities or vicious circle that can establish and that may be actually really uh, what happens in many of those conditions. In fact, when there are um, vicious circles or circular causalities, there is essentially no um, continuum between states, between states that can be health and pre-disease or disease, uh, and so there can be complete uh, disruptions uh, that will lead to uh, situations of disease that will be really complicated to set back to uh, the initial condition. Now, how does food come into play between gut microbiota and health. Um, I will uh, discuss the specific elements of gene richness. Uh, we have come to realize that the distribution of the human population in a number, number of individuals as a function of gene count um, is not the usual bell-shaped curve for biological criteria, but it's uh, a shoulder to the left indicating a fraction of the population that has a low gene count microbiome, which I call here hosibiosis, versus a larger fraction of the normal population with a high gene count. And in fact, the distribution is bimodal if we separate non-obese versus obese individuals. So we have a true fragment of the population on the left-hand side, postbiotic, 10 to 15% or so of the healthy population, 25 to 30% of the uh, overweight or moderately obese. It actually reaches 75% for the extreme obese with the BMI over 40. And we get to realize that postbiotic or low gene count is associated with more severe metabolic and inflammatory traits. This is specifically true or especially true in obesity. Uh, it's associated with non-response to calorie restriction in obesity. Uh, similarly, it's associated with severity or speed of progression in acute liver conditions. It can be all the way a marker of risk of death of liver conditions, and it's associated with non-response to cancer therapies, including the uh, latest highly uh, developing immunotherapy. Now, um, where food comes to play is that we, we were able to show that a high diverse fiber diet can actually correct postbiosis. 
What's illustrated here is that over a six weeks intervention with a low calorie diet, high protein, low fat, low glycemic index carbohydrates, but with a highly diverse fiber content, what we were able to observe is this rise in gene count, average gene count from the population that has at start at baseline a low gene count microbiome plus 25% in gene count. This is highly significant. We were led to postulate that the high diverse fiber content was doing the difference, making the difference, uh, i.e. a large diversity in primary substrates, plant fibers here, may promote diversification throughout the microbial food chain, promoting the fiber degraders to start with that actually feed the rest of the microbial community with uh, simpler sugars and hence promotes increase in richness. It's in a way a new paradigm that may have a major impact in terms of prevention. Now, we did go a little bit further with uh, my colleague Li Ping Zhao in work where we were addressing the impact of a whole grain, traditional Chinese medicinal food and prebiotic based diet not only in simple obesity, but also in Prader-Willi syndrome, which is a condition related to a genetic mutation that prevents from the perception of satiety. So infants, babies, infants have no perception of satiety. They crave for food all the time, and they very early in life become obese, in some cases extreme obese. What we were able to show is that with the dietary intervention, we were able to uh, reduce body weight, to reduce BMI in simple obesity, but also in Prader-Willi syndrome, early on recognized as a um, genetic disorder where diet would not be able to do anything. Um, we were able to show that the microbiome is changed by the diet over 30 days from rather similar um, diversity of microbiome in simple obesity or Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, to uh, this condition, not much more improvement following uh, the first 30 days of intervention, actually, in Prader-Willi syndrome. And this was associated to changes in metabolism uh, that was evidenced by changes in the urinary metabolome, also modulated mainly during the first 30 days of intervention. And my colleague Li Ping Zhao was able to show that uh, Again, comparing a whole grain traditional Chinese medicinal food and prebiotic diet versus an isocaloric uh, control diet, uh, the uh, uh, fiber rich diet would have a strong impact in terms of um, um, modulating diabetes parameters, such as um, uh, glycated hemoglobin, uh, such as the fraction of the population with low glycated hemoglobin, uh, such as fasting blood glucose, dramatically impacted. And the connection with microbial metabolism was linked to uh, butyric acid production, highly uh, increased or favored by the whole grain diet. And there was a connection with the GLP-1, which is a regulator of perception of satiety. Now we pushed this a little bit further in a French study uh, where we worked together with the company Bridor, a bread company, and uh, the uh, Human Nutrition Resource Research Center of Ronalp in Lyon, uh, implementing a crossover randomized control trial with 40 volunteers at metabolic risk based on the um, waist uh, circumference and uh, also dietary habits, uh, whereby we compared a multi-fiber bread, combining not only the usual uh, sources of fibers in bread, also uh, uh, extreme sources of fibers such as uh, pectins from citrus or uh, carob gum uh, or dextrins, uh, unusually present in bread. And in this study, what we were able to show is that, uh, well, we do modulate the microbiota. We have, a, uh, with multifiber bread, a reduction in pro-inflammatory bacteria such as Bacteroides vulgaritis and an increase in uh, uh, bacteria that are either directly involved in the degradation of fibers or possibly involved in anti-inflammatory properties, uh, especially via butyrate production. So only the consumption of fiber-enriched bread in our study modulated microbiota composition, and it induced a limitation of the potential deterioration of cholesterol levels and an improved 
insulin sensitive by 20% actually compared to control bread. Um, uh, to move towards my conclusion, I will just give another um, example of an intervention we performed, whereby we aimed to modulate the uh, microbiota richness together with intestinal permeability, inflammation, and oxidative stress in a mouse model of depression. Uh, mice are driven to um, a completely altered behavior by chronic uh, stress exposure for four weeks, and then they are treated for three weeks, uh, in our case, with a combination of glutamine, of lactobacillus rhamnus GG as a probiotic, of curcumin as a micronutrient, a polyphenol. Uh, and these are geared or here to address all four triggers of our uh, vicious circle. Uh, we compare this with clomipramine, a uh, classical antidepressant molecule. Uh, and what we were able to show is that based on the modulation of anxiety-like behavior or depressive-like behavior, we do correct the impact of uh, stress uh, exposure as well with uh, the combination of our three bioactives as we do with clomipramine, which is a tricyclic parental uh, antidepressant, which is known incidentally to have uh, high secondary effects. So to, um, to conclude, take home messages I would like to uh, convey is that we humans are microbial, we are ecosystems, we are symbiosis, and circular causalities may actually drive and maintain durable alterations of host microbe symbiosis. Now, this will have implications in our ability to monitor and to integrate microbiota and host parameters in the monitoring of the status of symbiosis in prevention or cure targeting several triggers of a vicious circle in altered host microbe symbiosis, with a, a crucial place in this case for bioactives, including fibers, including micronutrients, including probiotics and small molecules, and specifically in this case, diversity of the uh, dietary ingredients will matter. And it should lead to innovation in um, trial design as well, where novel methodologies to study chronic diseases with alteration of host microbe symbiosis will be awaited. I thank you very much for your attention and I will pass the word to our chairman, chairwoman. Thank you, Joelle. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Harry Berhert. Harry Berhert is an expert in plant and soil microbiome he is currently located at the Center for Desert Agriculture at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. So take it away, Herbert. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. And I think it's a fantastic um, opportunity to connect different threads. Uh, Tafis and Joel, they, they, they already gave fantastic introductions. So it really fits very well to what I want to tell you. I'm a, a professor of genetics, research director, and um, I've been working for uh, more than 40 years on basically how plants are, and microbes are interacting. And uh, in this case, I want to try to convince you that um, healthy soil makes healthy food, makes healthy humans. So that's a big equation. Um, if you want to read some more about us, uh, here's some, some information. The Darwin 21 project, uh, or also a recent um, presentation that I gave in, in Zurich that you can uh, look into. Um, as you heard um, already that uh, a dysbiosis uh, of the gut really has major uh, implications in, in human health. So the question is, of course, uh, where does it come from and how can we treat it? Um, and uh, the uh, multiple factors are actually uh, influencing the, the human gut microbiome. Uh, as Fabrice was uh, very nicely uh, laying out already, that we are uh, in, in, live in an environment and this environment um, has major influence on the, the gut microbiome. And the question is, can 
um, there's only very few places where you can actually change the, the human gut microbiome in its composition. Um, the most of these factors that are shown here, exercise, aging, drugs, geography, um, birth mode, these are factors that are um, contributing to basically the composition. But once you have this composition, people are thinking that this is it and you cannot change things. And I want to convince you that actually the diet is a major factor how you can change also your composition. So um, a simple solution would be then that you could uh, take healthy food, which makes um, healthy microbes and makes healthy humans. And that's uh, a big hypothesis that I put forward here um, in the context, of course, of this uh, major complexity. Now, we have to look into what healthy food really is all about. And as you heard uh, so far, our healthy food concept is really um, that healthy food should be rich in fiber and vitamins and minerals um, and um, other compositions, uh, types of sugars, proteins, things like that. So we are more actually looking into chemical or physical uh, components. And food has not been considered in terms of uh, microbiome itself. And this is a misunderstanding because uh, healthy food must also be rich in microbes. And most of you probably think if you buy food, you wash it um, properly, then there's no micro microbes left on the surface, which is true. On the, on the surface, there is microbes that you can try to wash off. It's not very efficient, I can tell you that. Um, but they actually, what people have been ignoring for a very long time is that Every plant and every food that you buy uh, basically has its own microbiome that you already get in the shop or wherever you, you buy. It. And actually raw vegetables and fruits are rich sources of healthy microbes. Now, we have to, must have a further look into this relationship, what the healthy microbes are really are all about. And first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the invisible world in and around us. Now, this, I think, is a fantastic illustration that could show you how you could see actually nature um, if, you, if you could see microbes. So to our, our eyes, they are invisible. Um, they are too small to be seen with, a, with our eyes. We can see them in the microscope. And uh, of course, the first view would be that you are covered with microbes, but in fact, this is, as we know now, the gut microbiome, the, the lungs, they're all filled with, with microbes in, in our human body. But this is not only true for, for humans or for animals. This is true for the soil. The soil is full of microbes. The trees or plants are full of microbes. And, and we have been ignoring this relationship uh, almost entirely until very recently. So maybe you want, some of you also don't know that, that already um, the, the sources of healthy microbes from plants uh, already comes with a seed. And uh, we talk here about the endosphere. So this is the, what is inside the plant. So every seed actually inherits its in, an individual microbiome from its mother plant. But very, in a way, very similar what, what happens already in, in, in human birth. Um, but it's, uh, and, but the plants are, of course, living also in, a, in, in an environment. And every seed that you put into a different uh, soil will actually be exposed to a, a very different soil microbiome. And for the most uh, part of history, we were thinking that soil is just, you know, chemi chemical and physical composition of things, but there's no life in it. And actually, soil is the richest source of life on this planet. So one gram of soil harbors about 10 trillion microbial cells of 10,000 different microbial species. So everything that you find on humans, animals, plants, actually is derived from, originally from soil. That's where the ultimate soil uh, source is. And plants are very clever. They are actually recruiting microbes from the soil that they are needing. So then a healthy plant actually has a healthy microbiome by itself and protects it from different 
um, pathogens. So this can be bacteria, viruses, insects, herbivores, um, and, and also make these plants resistant to drought and heat stress. Um, so <clears throat> moreover, there is more analogies. So you know that uh, the fecal transfer can suppress disease in, in, in humans. This has been one of the most um, eye-opening um, uh, revolutionary uh, um, therapies one could, one could see. But in fact, this also holds true in, in, in agriculture. So one knows for a long time that you can take actually a soil that keeps a certain plant happy and you can treat uh, a plant with that and it will be protecting the, the plants from disease. So for example, here shown in this fact from a typical um, disease state, uh, which you see on the, on the left side. So things are actually very similar between uh, plants and, and animals and humans. And um, the, we have to now look into a little more into our recent uh, way of dealing with, with, uh, uh, with ourselves and with our nature, as, as Fabrice uh, was, was telling us. We are actually have been very, are very concerned about uh, different chemicals that are um, that are uh, affecting our health, and we know now um, since recently that many of these chemicals are uh, indirectly affecting our health because they are affecting our microbes. So the human gut microbiota is, is very prone to interference by different chemicals and can also work on these chemicals to change their uh, nature. Um, that means that you can have uh, certain chemicals that are non-toxic and they become toxic or the other way around. There's a, in, in a million different possibilities. But in fact, um, almost all of these chemicals can also affect uh, the plant and the soil microbiota. Um, and especially if you think about industrial chemicals and pollutants. These are originally uh, coming into in very small uh, amounts to the human uh, body and the human gut, but actually these are uh, used in massive amounts in agriculture. So the mass, most um, chemicals that are used in agriculture are herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides, um, that, and they are basically applied to almost all agriculture. Here you have a little map which shows actually the amount of um, pesticides used per hectare, in, um, and and you can see this is all the all the, uh, the the data that are available. They show that there is massive use of these the chemicals. Now, um, what happens now? We know that this these chemicals affect the the human gut microbiome, but they already um, affect the soil microbiome and the plant microbiome. So you see here is, uh, in the, on the right side, this is basically a non-contaminated um, soil. And you see there is multiple colors which are re representing various different um, microbial species. And if you have pesticide contaminated sites, here are site one and site two uh, shown, you have a massive reduction of these, uh, of the complexity uh, that means a number of these species are basically disappearing, and this is exactly what Fabrice was saying. We are probably having in agriculture already er eradicated massively certain uh, species. Um, it's much more complicated. On, on, it's not just disappearing of species. It's actually also that we are favoring some species by treatment with different chemicals. And you see here, for example, in red, um, there's different chemicals that have been compared um, and, and with uh, different species uh, on the on the y-axis. So if you look um, for certain chemicals, they are um, the, reducing the number of, of species, so in green, but they are favoring some uh, species in, in red. And in fact, very similar effects have been identified in the human gut microbiome studies. So... Um, I just want to give you one case study, which uh, probably everybody of you know, glyphosate, this has been in the media, there's a big discussion um, uh, about, about the toxicity, and the toxicity, of course, of glyphosate uh, has been, uh, is thought 
to be minimal on humans because humans don't have the enzyme that is targeted by glyphosate, which is this uh, um, EPSPS. So it's, a, it's an enzyme that is basically part of the um, amino acid biosynthesis uh, pathway, but not in animals and humans. So it should, in fact, glyphosate should be an ideal um, herbicide. However, um, of course, it, it acts on, on these um, uh, enzymes that all plants have. So if you have a, a field that has been sprayed with a herbicide and then you come with a herbicide resistant uh, crop, and that's basically what we see on all acres. If you go out into the nature and you see a field that is basically free of any, any weed, that has been herbicide treated. But the thing that has been completely uh, forgotten is that the same enzymes are uh, present in all microbes. So that means when you are spraying glyphosate on, on the field, you are affecting all these microbes. And you, um, so one study here shows that about 54% of the core human gut microbiome is sensitive to glyphosate. So many of the effects that actually might be considered to be glyphosate derived in, in, in human might be uh, due to the effects on the, on the gut microbiome. Um, the same, again, is true that glyphosate reduces the soil, rises here community, and with that, of course, you will, when you buy the nice fruit and, and food, um, and you think that is very good for you, there is a, a deficiency of these microbes. So um, there is um, every year um, this environmental working group publishes basically the dirty dozen of the most pesticide treated foods. Or um, the, the the thing is, I mean, of course you have the residues of these um, of these uh, pesticides on 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 these uh, and all these uh, um, vegetables and fruit that you see here. Uh, they look perfectly healthy, and this would be the best uh, food that you think to buy, right? But in fact, uh, one, one drawback is that when you have, uh, um, that all these derived pesticides have reduced the microbiome in the, in the fruit and in the vegetables already. So you are getting much less potentially uh, good ones into your system. So I think what, what the whole argument is that we have to basically grow back and start at agriculture, and, and and agriculture makes out most of in our environment today. It's not that we are having to look at into some specific um, nature reserve parks and and think about this uh, what what exists there. Massive, the, the biggest part of our environment is actually uh, used in agriculture, and we are using in conventional agriculture massive amount of herbicides, fertilizers, pesticides. And this, I hope I could convince you, shows you that already we have a poor soil microbiome and we have a fragile plant microbiome. And we have to change into a future agriculture to replace most of these chemicals here. And with that, we can make a rich soil microbiome and a healthy plant microbiome. And of course, uh, this is also what I think what is the difference between a conventional food and a, and, a, and a healthy food. And the healthy food um, must contain, must be pesticide free and must also be microbiome rich. And this is a, would, in my view, be a healthy, give a healthy gut microbiome. So directly and indirectly, because it feeds a healthy gut microbiome, but it also adds exactly the, the, the important players. Now, one of the things that I think uh, when I, I, I was working um, on this, uh, I was looking into basically publications, and there's a search of publications in the, in the human gut microbiome. You will see, and over the last five years, about 30,000 papers um, have been published. And, uh, but if you now look into the, into the connection between the gut microbiome and pesticides, or into the gut microbiome and organic food, this is a tiny little fraction of actually what we are looking at. Uh, so I think we need some more studies and we, we need some more funding that goes into this direction because I think this is completely underfunded and underestimated. So um, uh, this is basically one of my final uh, slides here. 
where I try to, to, to convince you that actually we need to work on a healthy soil and healthy agriculture, because this is the basis for healthy food and also an, an environment. Uh, um, and, and this is the basis for healthy humans. Of course, we healthy humans are not actually at the end of this chain. We are the major players of this. We are going in all directions uh, in the system. We are changing the agriculture and we can also change environment and uh, and we can also determine what is healthy food. So the take home messages in my view are healthy soil is rich source of microbes. Healthy soil is also equal to healthy plants and healthy plants is, are equal to healthy food. And healthy food must also be considered in terms of healthy microbes uh, as a rich source of healthy microbes, which is essential for healthy humans. And with that, I, my micro, microbiome and me thank for your attention, and I pass back to the <laughs> to our um, convener. Thank you. I'm Emeron Meyer, professor at UCLA, and I had the pleasure of co-chairing this uh, fascinating session with um, the three speakers um, and. We'll take a couple of minutes to just um, make a closing of, of this uh, of the session. So we heard talks about um, by uh, Dr. De Klerk about the one Earth concept um, from Dr. Duray about the um, gut microbiome diversity, and from Dr. Hurt about soil microbiome diversity. So the common themes that came up um, through all three presentations even though all three individuals came from very different um, areas of the field, was the theme of interconnectedness, ecological systems, um, and as a part of this, the, the uh, concepts of diversity and resilience. <clears throat> These are not, uh, normally not topics that come up in a, in a presentation about um, uh, healthy nutrition, but I think they have come to the forefront uh, in many discussions. Um, and um, recently also in, in an increasing number of uh, publications. So let's start um, with the role of, uh, the unique role of uh, microbes. So microbes are the oldest life form on the planet. Um, they have lived in the oceans for at least um, 4 billion years, 3.5 billion years before any other life form appeared. Um, they had a lot of time to perfect their communication systems and accumulate a vast number of genes, which gives, give them uh, abilities that most other um, life on Earth does not have. Um, for example, they are extremely adaptable and resilient. They're adaptable to the worst, um, or to the most dramatic changes in the environment. Uh, they have survived um, catastrophic uh, events on planet Earth, um, and they've survived several uh, waves of extinction. And as I said, they have the greatest gene pool of, of a, a life form on, on Earth, which gives them this ability to, um, um, and most of these genes, we don't really know what they um, do yet. So just a, as a comparison, we humans have about mere, a mere 20,000 genes, um, whereas the microbes um, has been, have been estimated to have between two and 20 million microbial genes. So if you put those two together, this concept of a holobiont, um, the microbial genes make up about 99% of our gene pool. Um, they, they have the ability to rapidly adapt to changing environmental factors, to a change in diet. Um, they have adapted to the unhealthy diet that we have um, consumed over the last 75 years, but our human bodies uh, have not been able to, to um, mirror this, uh, this dramatic change. One important concept that has come up, particularly in the, in the first presentation of Dr. De Klerk, is the systems view of the microbiome. Um, not surprising coming from an ecologist. Um, it's, it's definitely the one um, aspect or, or the one dimension of microbiome science to look at it as a, as a complex system. 
as opposed to try to focus on individual microbes as uh, microbiology and um, um, the search for pathogens if, if, if really concentrated on. So one of these systems, um, and, and it shows the, the connectivity with the environment as well. So within the body, there's not a linear relationship between the microbes in our gut and uh, our organ systems, which is here illustrated for the brain. Um, but it is these bidirectional loops that connect um, um, the different players or nodes in that system, um, which leads to feedback loops and a completely nonlinear behavior. What we see here is a very simplified view of this. In reality, um, there's hundreds, possibly thousands of these arrows going back and forth. What's also important to realize that this close connection to the environment. So we, we all know from the environment, we are exposed to stressors um, and psychosocial stressors, um, but also we derive our food from the environment. Um, we um, get pathogens from the environment um, and we are linked as we bec as became clear in, in, in one of the presentations very closely to the soil microbiome and its health. Another very fascinating um, aspect of this um, systems view of the microbiome are the similarities between plant and human health. So a group of molecules that um, interacts closely with the, the rhizosphere, the, the root system of plants and plays a major role in defending the plants against uh, all kinds of um, perturbations, stressors, uh, drought, UV light, uh, pests, insecticides. Um, are these polyphenols as very large molecules uh, that the plants produce and they're most concentrated in their, in their seeds and uh, fruit and in their leaves. So when we consume um, plants that have been grown in a healthy soil with a lot of interactions between soil microbes and the root system, which is essential to stimulate this polyphenol production. When we eat these plants, um, they, these plants are not absorbed in our small intestine because a large portion is um, made up of undigestible fiber. And of these large um, molecular polyphenols are too large to be absorbed in the small intestine, or first part of the intestine. So they make it down into um, the distal small intestine and into the colon, where there are um, have several functions. They feed the um, prebiotics for, for the gut microbes, contribute to the diversity, just like fiber does. Um, and the, the microbes can break them down in digestible and absorbable molecules, which are then absorbed um, and provide health benefits throughout our body and um, including the brain. So the same role that the, these polyphenols um, play um, mediating between the microbiome, either in the soil or uh, in, in, in our gut, um, is sort of becoming apparent. This is probably the best example um, why a largely plant-based diet um, is good for, for the, the microbes in our gut. Um, and on the other hand, why a healthy soil is important for enriching the plants that we eat with the largest diversity and concentration of these health uh, promoting molecules. So if you put this all together, um, the first talk started with this one health, uh, one, um, um, one planet uh, concept. I would like to apply this also to the one health concept. So the close interconnectedness between human health, gut health, health of our organs, um, the health of plants and the soil, which play a big role in our own health. Um, and then the consequences of a diet that is optimal for the soil microbiome um, and for our gut microbiome, how that diet is also have benefits uh, for the environment um, and is uh, a, a major factor in combating climate change. So I would like to thank again the speakers for their stimulating and excellent presentations um, and I'm looking forward to the questions from the audience.
Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you to all the speakers. And we have about 15 minutes now for Q&A. And I'd like to start with um, Fabrice. And the, the question that has gotten the most attention is about the Eat Lancet report. And um, basically, can you comment on the uptake of this tool and ways in which we might successfully promote it? Sure, sure, certainly. So, so the Eat Lancet report published two years ago uh, generated much controversy for, for some, but, but also was used by, by many others. Uh, and I, I think you know, two points I'd want to emphasize is that the dietary guidelines were really developed based on, on human health uh, objectives primarily. They were not developed looking at environmental considerations. But the second part was asking what is the impact of a healthy diet on, on environments? I think one of the biggest challenges we had is that many people read the mean value that was produced for each food group rather than looking at the range and just really didn't recognize that within what is healthy, there's tremendous diversity, flexibility, and opportunity. So, so much of the controversy I find was really focused on that mean value for, for red meat consumption in particular, rather than, than again, uh, looking at the range. I think for red meat, it was zero to 400, uh, zero to uh, 200 grams per week was the range that was proposed. And so within that diet, yeah, that there's good evidence that vegan and vegetarian can be healthy and equally good evidence that a balanced omnivore or flexitarian diet can also uh, be, uh, be healthy. So, so when we look at its recommendations compared to the global burden of disease or the WHO, FAO, uh, uh, health and sample dietary recommendations, they're actually quite similar. Uh, and when we look at the global challenges that we're faced with in terms of malnutrition, both in terms of under and over consumption, uh, they really are much larger uh, than the range proposed. So I think, I think it's been a really useful tool to point out uh, universal healthy diets, but a diversity of pathways towards healthy diets. And, and we're thrilled with the way that's created some really important conversations, mm -hmm. including leading up to UN Food System Summit uh, later on this year. Yeah. Okay, um, so I'm gonna kind of go in order. So the next would be for Joelle. And this was related to um, your concepts of microbial diversity. And what role do you think it could have potentially played in the COVID-19 epidemic? Okay. Um, actually, uh, what we have got to uh, realize quite rapidly in the COVID pandemic is that the most severe forms are connected with uh, risk factors such as uh, diabetes, obesity, and or uh, old age. And all three uh, we know come with altered symbiosis. Uh, there is alteration of uh, uh, gut permeability and immunity in these contexts, and possibly that would be uh, uh, conferring a higher risk of developing severe conditions. Um, now, our society is increasing the risk of pandemics uh, because of the way we deal with uh, nature overall or globally, as was illustrated by the presentation of Fabrice, but we are also um, uh, increasing the sensitivity to severe forms by the way we alter human microbes uh, symbiosis. So do you think that I've seen some papers looking at different probiotics potentially as a treatment for um, COVID? Do you, what do you feel about that? Um, I, I think more generally, and, and we, uh, we discussed that a little bit already in the presentations, uh, acting with one single microbe mm -hmm. might be uh, complicated to uh, really uh, reset and alter the host microbe symbiosis. Um, I think more globally, uh, overall nutrition uh, could be a, a nice way to uh, leverage um, altogether microbiome, gut permeability, inflammation, oxidative stress, and that might probably be the, the best way to go uh, as a start, I would think. Okay. So um, I'll ask the next question and then I'll turn it over to Emran to ask a few, but there's been a number of questions and this is um, sort of directed to Heribert about the concept of regenerative agriculture is one, but also the, the movement towards more hydroponic or greenhouse types of um, crop systems. And you know, what do you think is the impact of, of those systems potentially on um, the soil and plant microbiome? Yeah, that's an interesting question because basically um, it would be a possibility to 
manipulate or to direct uh, the microbiome in an aquaponic system or in a, in a, in a greenhouse system that uses artificial uh, media for growth of, of plants. Um, and uh, the problem is that at the moment, we don't really know how to, what is, what are all the good players and the important players. So um, as I try to point out, in, if you just take a, a, um, a little bit of soil from different places in the world, you will have a, a very different landscape of, of microbes. And if you take different plant species, you will have a very different landscape of, of, of the, the microbes that live within the, them. So it's like actually every plant that you're looking at has its own family of, of microbes. Mm -hmm. Plus the system gets more complicated because they are also depending on where they live in which soil they live and plants are always living in the soil. They are recruiting uh, microbes that they actually need for uh, living in this specific environment. So we have actually a, a huge complexity that we have poorly scratched uh, at the surface. So it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, the iceberg and we just look, uh, we just discover that there's an iceberg swimming. Mm. Okay. Sharon, do you want me to continue with the questions? I'm sure we, we only have about eight more minutes, so. Okay. <clears throat> I, I personally had a quick question, um, kind of addressed really to all the speakers. Um, and that question is why, why and how can diet restore a microbial ecosystem if many strains have already gone extinct? Is, are, are we aiming for doing the best we can do with, the, with this impoverished ecosystem or are we actually gonna be able to bring some of those uh, microbes in, in that whole system back. I'll, well, that... I'll take this first and then uh, probably others can, uh, can go on. Um, I was illustrating how we were able by uh, um, diet to increase by 25% the richness of a microbiome that was initially really uh, poor. And uh, the concept behind is that uh, it's dietary habits that actually reduce the dominant microbiota, but still we keep in subdominant fraction microbes that are ready to come up again if you open the ecological niches for them. And so just diversifying the uh, richness in, in plant material will bring in a lot of biomolecules that are different in their form, in their shape, and that are taken care of by different microbes. And so you will essentially increase the top of the food chain for the microbes, and they will actually feed the rest of the community. So what we envision is that this diversification is simply, uh, or it's possibly uh, manipulated by the uh, input of a high diversity of fibers in the diet to, to start with. <clears throat> Okay, um, uh, Dr. Hurt, I, I was gonna ask you a question. I, I, I got the impression that um, you focused a lot on the microbial um, um, presence on various plant-based foods um, as, a, as a health beneficial and, and, and good for our human microbiome. Do you think that that's an important component or do you think the other component that the soil microbes stimulate these plants to make more of the polyphenols, which we then consume, is more important. Do you think the direct transfer of microbes or do you think the indirect transfer of these phytonutrients? Um, it is un indisputable that actually certain microbes in plants are producing certain features, such as certain vitamins. Actually, it's not the plants that are producing the vitamins, it's the microbes that are producing the vitamins in the plants that we are then eating and we say, okay, you have to eat this plant to get the vitamins, but in fact, it's the microbes. Now, the problem is that in current agriculture, we are using so much chemicals that we have actually deprived the soil and with that also the microbes in the plants because they are the most prone to actually inhibition and extinction as Fabrice was telling. Um, so in fact, we have to look into soils that have not been treated with chemicals, which is, uh, this is, a, the, I think, the ultimate source. This is the, the holy grail, where we can actually still find uh, 
um, the all the all the good um, the good uh, microbes that we might have already extinct uh, in 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 a lot of the you know long term uh, treated uh, uh, agricultural fields that um, that we use, um, and I think that's that's where we have to go. We have to roll back. We have to actually really try to get rid of uh, the chemicals um, that which are basically antimicrobials. All are antimicrobials if you look in, into their action. Um, and we have to replace them with, uh, with soft chemicals or with, with microbes that actually do the job in a sustainable way. Yeah, I mean, this is also addressing a very important point um, that <clears throat> you know, everybody is recommending um, more a plant-based diet, uh, you know, 75%. And, um, but at the same time, there, there are all these, so, so we see these shifts that are being celebrated as going in this direction with um, the plant-based meat substitutes, for example, which are, many of them are made out of soybeans, which are grown the same, um, the same negative way that you have described. Um, yes. So eating, uh, e eating like the impossible burger essentially would do, would not be any, any significant benefit. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, so maybe we only have a couple more minutes, but that was actually one of the questions that came as, um, because there are many registered dietitians and nutritionists in the audience, and they, they would like all of you or any of you to comment on, you know, what types of concrete actions are we able to recommend to consumers that would um, eat, that would better balance planetary and human health? So maybe Fabrice, we'll, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, so I think I think there's a lot of things that dietitians can can do. You know, so, and so one, of course, from a plant to health perspective is. Uh, is look at composition. So, so for many of us that were in Western audiences, uh, it may indeed be reducing uh, red meat consumption in particular, but I think uh, more importantly or more positively, uh, focusing on increasing diversity of fresh produce in diet, fruits, nuts, vegetables. And I think many, many people are, are really calling or raising attention to the role of fiber in diet, which is probably you know, something we don't speak enough about as, as a recommendation. Um, I'm always hesitant to say, you know, is there a food that we should be consuming more of? I mean, I think this often is a trap you call into, you fall into, right? Is recommending a food which will, which will fix it rather than a whole of plates approach. So, so I think as long as on, on whole of plates, we're striving for balance, we're including the fresh uh, produce, uh, we're, we're including minimally processed uh, produce and a diversity, eat your colors, I think is what we like to say, at least in, in ecology, that this, this is at least the foundation for recommendation upon which specific recommendations can be built. All right. So Joel, would you like to add anything else? Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, so our fellow dietitian are pointing at what could be, a, in my view, a microbiome friendly uh, diet. Um, I think I, I only have rather straightforward uh, answers, I think, uh, although it may seem generalizations, but more organic plant derived food makes a big difference. Uh, we have documented that uh, already uh, quite extensively. Diversity matters. Diversity matters greatly. I think that uh, if you concentrate on the bringing plant in the diet, uh, you have to convince people to bring diversity in their uh, plant intake. And um, uh, more uh, organic plant-derived food uh, overall makes, uh, makes a big difference. Diversity matters and, and least transformed. I think is also uh, an important point. I like actually to recommend 25 different plant-based portions per week rather than the uh, five uh, fruits and vegetables per day we recommend in France, because I think that when people go shopping, they really think diversity. Yep. Okay, well, we only have about a minute left. So I would just like to, to wrap up and thank all of the speakers for their presentations. I would recommend the attendees to please go to the Yogurt and Nutrition Initiative website. There's a lot more information on this topic out there, as well as just general health and nutrition. What we will be doing afterwards is we'll be um, collecting all of these questions and giving the um, speakers an opportunity to answer those, and we'll be reposting those on our website as well. So we didn't have time to get to everything, but um, I'm really hoping that everybody learned a lot today. I know that I did. And I'd like to thank Dr. Meyer for co-chairing and all of our speakers and of course, Yini and ASN. So thank you everyone. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>